Thanks very much, Philip. Um, look, it's great to be here, um, and it's an incredibly exciting time in hepatitis C, and I think there's real opportunities. Um, I like to frame things in terms of opportunities rather than challenges uh, in relation to hepatitis C, and I think uh, we're living in, in times of enormous opportunity. So I want to take you through a process of looking at what we've done in Australia, and there may be some lessons for, for other areas in terms of what we've been able to achieve. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I'm going to cover some background epidemiology of hepatitis C and disease burden in Australia, talk about the development of the broad DA access program, um, give you some information about our initial uh, treatment uptake, um, talk specifically about linkage to care and treatment for people who inject drugs, um, some strategies to enhance uh, hepatitis C elimination, um, and then uh, some aspects of treatment prevention. We're doing quite a bit of research on that uh, in Australia. Um, just to set the scene, this is our sort of treatment care cascade in Australia. So we have about 230,000 people estimated to be living with chronic hepatitis C. Um, these figures are about a year old. Uh, at that stage, we thought three quarters uh, of that population were diagnosed. In fact, we've just got our revised sort of figures and it's just above 80% at the moment, we believe. Uh, so the large majority of people are diagnosed. Uh, up until this new program, we'd only treated 20% over the sort of 20 years of interferon-based therapy uh, and cured a bit over half of those people that we treated. So two decades uh, of treatment with interferon-based therapy, we've done a little bit in terms of impacting the epidemic. I'll show you some figures that I think we're very confident to cure more people in 2016 than we've cured in two decades of interferon-based therapy in Australia. Um, now, it's a very important time, I think, right now in terms of access to therapy for people living with chronic hepatitis C because uh, in most countries we have ageing populations of people with hepatitis C. Uh, many people were infected in the 1980s and 1990s are now moving through into their sort of middle age, 40s and 50s. You can see in this research where we've linked all the notifications in, uh, in New South Wales where hepatitis C is a mandatory notification to a range of different databases including the National Death Index, hospitalisation, so we can track sort of mortality uh, related to drug use and to liver related mortality. You can see as people age, clearly the risk of liver related mortality is increasing and drug related mortality declining. Um, so this also shows that we, we can't forget about drug-related morbidity and mortality, but with these ageing populations we're going to see an increasing burden of liver disease. This is some modelling work that we've done in collaboration with Homi Rizavi, and this is the projected number of people with advanced liver disease complications, so liver cancer, primary liver cancer, or decompensated cirrhosis, without an increase in the treatment numbers. So based on what we were doing with interferon-based therapy, and you can see here from where we are, the mid-2010s, uh, this really rapid escalation will happen if we don't have an increasing uh, rate of treatment uptake and improved outcomes. Fortunately, this is when the new era is be beginning. Um, so our first objective is really to get this curve, not to escalate, but at least to start plateauing and then obviously to decline. Um, so we're doing some further modelling to look at the, the numbers of people we obviously need to treat to have an impact on those outcomes. Um, I think everyone's aware of this incredible sort of uh, recent therapeutic development in hepatitis C, uh, from what I call the bad old days of interferon monotherapy in the mid-1990s, uh, where the cure rates were only about 10% and this sort of progressive improvement in cure rates, but at a tolerability cost. So as we added therapies to interferon uh, and then the first generation proteases, we were improving cure but we were making it more difficult for patients to get through treatment. And then we started to turn to the right in terms of tolerability, and our big leap forward once we removed interferon from the regimen uh, perspective, and we now have several regimens available. In terms of what's available in Australia for treatment at the moment, we do have pegylated interferon, ribavirin with sofosbuvir for genotype 4 and 6, uh, but that's a very small proportion of the Australian population, so that the vast majority of patients have access to interferon-free regimens. Uh, the regimen from Merck will be listed on what we call our pharmaceutical benefits scheme uh, on the 1st of December. So we'll have access to that regimen as well. So we have um, several interferon-free regimens available uh, at the moment. And 
new regimens will come through over the next 12 months as well. So it's an incredible uh, environment, I think, at the moment in terms of treatment. I think we're all aware of the, the success of these regimens in terms of the high cure rates, the so-called sustained virological response uh, measured at 12 weeks post-treatment um, with you know, consistently uh, cure rates in the sort of mid-90% <coughs> mark with, with the different regimens. Um, so I think we have prepared the foundation in Australia um, for elimination of hepatitis C as a public health problem. We're not going to eliminate every single virus in every single person with hepatitis C by 2026. But we believe we can achieve the WHO elimination goals, and I'll talk about that later, uh, a little bit ahead of time. So they're the 2030 goals. We believe that we can get there within the next decade. Um, look, the reason why I'm confident is that Australia has fortunately had some really important uh, governmental leadership. And this is our health minister, who in May last year stated that access for all to highly effective hepatitis C treatments was a priority. And that was before um, things had been what we call listed on our universal pharmaceutical benefit scheme. But she stated that to say that we're trying to achieve this in terms of uh, uh, the negotiations that were subsequently undertaken with the pharmaceutical industry. And in December, she announced that funding for hepatitis C treatment was being put aside or made available uh, for a five-year period and announced that one billion Australian dollars uh, would be made available over that five-year period. Um, there's some key aspects of that in terms of the arrangement that I'll go through, but clearly that was a watershed moment. So what are the key features of the access program to uh, DA therapy in Australia. As I said, several regimens subsidised since March the 1st, with more to follow in late 2016 and expected in 2017. Uh, no restrictions based on liver disease or drug and alcohol use. So really no restrictions at all. So the only restriction is you have to be 18 years or older and have chronic hepatitis C. That's it. So nothing else is required. Uh, importantly, no cap on the number of patients treated per year. So there's no limit. The government said that they wanted to pay for 62,000 patients being treated over that five year period, but, and that's roughly you know, 12,000 patients treated per year, but there's no cap on the number of patients we can treat. So there's a risk sharing arrangement with the pharmaceutical industry, therefore the expenditure is capped. Now, aspects of the risk sharing arrangement are confidential, um, but you know, they've set aside at least a billion dollars. It might end up being more than that, obviously, um, but there is security in terms of the government because they know what their maximum spend per year is, so they know what the budget impact is going to be. Um, there's obviously a financial return, a return on investment for the pharmaceutical industry, and the patients obviously win because there's no cap on treatment numbers. So I call it a win-win-win. Uh, for government in terms of security, for the industry in terms of return on investment, and certainly for people living with chronic hepatitis C. Importantly, and this is quite different to, to many countries, there's a broad practitioner base. So any registered medical practitioner in Australia can prescribe these new therapies. Now specialists can prescribe, um, the general practitioners and other non-specialists require a consultation with a specialist. That doesn't mean that the patient has to be consulted, but they have to generally fill out details on a form or send an email with an, a form attached through to a specialist. The specialist then approves the treatment and then the GP can prescribe the drug. Uh, for the more experienced general practitioners and other clinicians, that requirement for consultation will be waived at the end of the year and that requirement will only be there for the sort of what we call the lower caseload or the less experienced general practitioners. But any registered med medical practitioner in Australia uh, can prescribe these new therapies. Uh, to get the therapy authorised, you have to make a phone call to Canberra. Um, it takes about one minute. They ask for the patient details, uh, what we call our Medicare number. They ask for the genotype, and they ask whether the patient has cirrhosis or not. They're the only details they ask and it's a very smooth system. Um, importantly as well, there's access to retreatment. 
both for virological failure and for reinfection. So there's no exclusion to retreatment for people who become reinfected, either you know, HIV infected, gay or bisexual men becoming reinfected sexually or through drug use or you know, people who inject drugs becoming reinfected. That's crucial if we're talking about trying to control and eliminate hepatitis C as a public health problem. And I think we should aim for treating more than 120,000 in the first five years. And I'll show you data that suggests that we're absolutely on track and we should be able to do even better than that. I think one of the foundations of development of this uh, scheme was that we've had a series of national hepatitis C strategies. So the first national hepatitis C strategy was in 2000. They're generally sort of three to four year strategies. So we're now in our fourth national hepatitis C strategy. And that's a similar sort of framework to how we have developed the response to HIV. We're in our seventh HIV national strategy. Um, but they're individual strategies. They're not sort of across bloodborne viruses. Uh, we have a, a national hepatitis B strategy a distinct national hepatitis C strategy and a distinct national HIV strategy. We've also uh, very recently, when we knew we were going to get access to these new therapies, developed consensus guidelines on the management of uh, hepatitis C that brought together all the, the key peak organisations uh, and community organisations, Hepatitis Australia. Um, there's some interesting aspects of those guidelines. Uh, for example, in terms of virological monitoring on treatment, there's no recommendation uh, in terms of requirements on treatment monitoring because it was felt that there wasn't an evidence base for it. Even though some people still do it, for example, we often do it at week four uh, on treatment, but the consensus guidelines state that you don't have to. Um, there's also, I think, other aspects in terms of the national strategy since 2000 has been, um, we've had a national hepatitis C testing policy since the early 2000s as well. And that very clearly uh, sort of outlined who the risk groups are, who should be tested. Uh, in terms of general practitioners, we sent out a monograph to every general practitioner in the country in the early 2000s as well, outlining different aspects of hepatitis C, again, including who should be screened and, uh, and referral and mani general management issues. Um, and I think what's been important is we have had this partnership approach involving government, community, sort of clinical peak bodies and academic representatives that dates back, as I said, to the original sort of HIV response, but has been developed in parallel for hepatitis C. I think what has also been important is the funding of both national and state-based uh, organisations, community organisations, both hepatitis C community organisations and drug user community organisations. So in each state and territory, there's a hepatitis organisation and a drug user organisation, and then there's an umbrella national sort of peak body, both on the hepatitis side and the drug user side. Um, and they've been pivotal in terms of advocacy, uh, including for access to DA therapy. Um, and as I said, we've had this sort of general practitioner in addiction medicine, clinician education, uh, really from the early 2000s. And I think as you certainly have here in Switzerland, um, harm reduction approach for people who inject drugs uh, since the early 1990s has been another sort of foundation element I think that's been important. Um, and hepatitis C hasn't been a sort of a what we call a political football. Um, there's been, like there was with HIV, I think bipartisan support across the sort of left wing and the more conservative sort of governments in terms of the response. In fact, the government in Australia right now is a conservative government and they were the government that brought in you know, broad access to these new therapies, not a left-wing government. So it's interesting. Um, and in the early sort of years of the HIV response, it was a, a, the Labor government, a left-wing sort of government, but there was support from the conservative side as well, a very much a bipartisan sort of approach. So how are we doing in terms of our, our treatment numbers? So from the March the 1st, we had our access program. I've got data here just for the first four months that I'll show you. Um, before the interferon-free uh, era, we were about middle of the pack. We were only treating about 1% of the chronic hep C population per year. Um, I mean, France and Germany were treating 5%. It's pretty amazing with you know, what I think is pretty toxic uh, interferon-based therapy, but they were, they were, <laughs> they were do doing a lot better than we were. Um, here is what we've done in the first four months. So um, we're at about a bit over 22,000 people commenced on therapy since March. Um, we think we've got some very preliminary data uh, for 
uh, July and August. We think we're about 30,000 now, okay, and I'm very confident we'll get to 40,000 by the end of the year. Um, so that's in 10 months we would treat, that would equate to about 17 to 18 percent of the chronic uh, infection population. Now this is not surprising, the first two months were sort of it's been a huge month because we had these big so-called warehouses in the big tertiary clinics um, and people were waiting for these new therapies to become available. My wrist was getting sore, sort of you know, writing scripts. Um, and, but it's very encouraging, again July and August are very similar, about 4,000 people commenced on therapy um, each month. And what's really interesting is the proportion of scripts written by general practitioners is increasing nicely. So from less than 10% in March to about 30% now in the later months. So as the therapy becomes more broadly based, I think this is really crucial. You'll see, I think, countries that have access through just specialist clinics alone, they'll have you know, big treatment, I think, in the early sort of period. And then if you don't have sort of greater reach into sort of community clinics and primary care practices, I think it'll fall away. It'll be really interesting to follow that in the different settings over the next sort of few years. But I'm confident that we won't have that sort of fall off, certainly not as great as many other countries that don't have a broad practitioner base. In terms of uh, the therapy that we're prescribing, uh, not surprisingly, it's largely sort of sophosphere based. Uh, so sophosphere lidiposphere, uh, almost 60%. So that reflects the genotype one proportion in Australia, which is about you know, 55%. So phosphate decladosphere, although it's uh, listed for genotype 1 and 3, uh, is pretty much used for genotype 3 in Australia. So that gives us an idea of the genotype 3 population. And again, that's very consistent with our sort of genotype distribution. A little bit of sophosphere in others. This would be a little bit of sophosphere in ribavirin for genotype 2 uh, because we don't have sophosphate decladosphere actually listed for genotype 2. And a little bit of sophosphere pegylate interferon in ribavirin for those genotype 4 and, and 6 patients. Uh, and a tiny bit of uh, the Vicuripac since. But Vicuripac was only listed in May, not in March. Okay, so it's interesting. We also have data on the treatment duration, at least the planned treatment duration, and, and that's uh, interesting to look at. So you can see here only about 10% are prescribing eight weeks of, of sophosphere lidiposphere, and that's clinician conservatism. Uh, because there'd be a much higher proportion that would fit the eligibility criteria for eight weeks, which is pre-cirrhosis, genotype one, viral load less than six million. Um, but a lot of clinicians are saying, well, the treatment's very well tolerated. What's the problem with prescribing 12 weeks? You know, it doesn't cost the government any more. It's not a cost per pill or a cost per month. It's a cost per course. There's a cap anyway, so let's prescribe 12 weeks. Um, so it'll be interesting to, to track that. What's interesting is for genotype three, the, the listing for people with genotype 3 and cirrhosis is 24 weeks. And those with pre-cirrhosis, it's 12 weeks of sophosphere to cladosphere. So this gives us a very good idea of the proportion with cirrhosis. So you can see here, it's about 40%. So even though we have broad-based access in terms of liver disease stage, there's no doubt that there's some initial targeting of treatment for people with more advanced disease. So in the big tertiary clinics, there's a lot of people with advanced disease obviously waiting for these therapies. So again, it'll be interesting to track that as we move forward, and I imagine that this proportion will start to head down. As the therapy becomes more broadened, and through primary care and other practices, uh, to people with early liver disease, obviously we're treating a lot of people with early disease as well, but it, it gives us some idea of what the disease spectrum is. Um, the gender breakdown is very consistent with our uh, notification system, almost two thirds male and, and a bit over a third female. The age distribution is interesting. Again, this gives us an idea that there is some targeting to people with more advanced disease. If we looked at our distribution for people living with chronic hepatitis C, the peak would be in the sort of mid to late 40s in terms of our epidemic, but our treatment peak is in the 50s. So again, suggesting that people have been infected a bit longer, more advanced disease, uh, at sort of taking up treatment greater rates at least initially. Um, so this is back to that sort of cascade of care um, it's interesting, this is my prediction for 2016, I think we'll treat uh, 40,000, we've treated 45,000 uh, before, but we'll cure 36,000 if we have a 90% cure rate. So we'll cure more people in 2016 than we've cured in two decades of interferon-based therapy, I'm pretty confident about that. 
and this is what's going to happen to you know, the cascade of care. I've only reduced it by 30,000 because I'm estimating about 6,000 new chronic infections. So we obviously have ongoing transmission. So I'll have to obviously keep an eye on that. Um, but this is in 10 months of the new therapy program. Obviously, as we head towards elimination, we want to get the pool of chronic infection that are moving downwards and the, the, cure, the cure numbers moving upwards. So it'll be really interesting to track that as we move forward. So what about elimination by 2016? These are WHO global hepatitis strategy targets. <coughs> They've um, set a goal of 90% reduction in new cases. This is the Hep B and Hep C uh, goal and a 65% reduction in liver-related mortality. To do that, they've said that we should, be, should have treated 80% of the population by 2030. Um, what do we need to do? Well, there's a lot of things we need to do. We've had a great start in the, in the first several months, but there's much more work to do. I think we do need to keep sort of raising awareness. We've been pretty good in Australia at community awareness. We have a high sort of screening rate, but there's still that 20% of people undiagnosed. I'm hoping that the optimism of these new therapies will bring some people forward for screening who feel they might, might have been at risk. And already we've looked at the testing numbers and since March there has been a blip up in terms of the number of hep C tests that are being done across uh, Australia. So hopefully that's reflective of sort of testing some people that were at risk. Um, we do need further GP education and mentorship. Um, I've been involved in a lot of sort of programs in terms of training. Uh, general practitioners and it's a bit really been a rewarding uh, part of my professional career. And it's great to see you know, new uh, clinicians coming through and getting involved in uh, hepatitis C management. Um, clearly we need enhanced drug and alcohol and prison-based hepatitis C treatment. We're putting a lot of effort into that in Australia. We do need to monitor you know, treatment uptake and outcomes. Um, people are concerned how we're going to do in the real world, so we're s I'll talk about it a bit later. We are setting up a national registry of treatment outcomes. Uh, from the different sort of settings in terms of the models of care. Um, and we need to evaluate, in a research sense, um, hepatitis C treatment and as prevention. There's been a lot of modelling work done, and uh, the modelling work shows that it should be achievable, but what about empirical data in terms of whether it works uh, in, in the real world? And I think Australia you know, can uh, lead things internationally in some aspects, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, importantly, particularly in terms of reducing the risk of uh, reinfection, but also reducing the risk of you know, first infections uh, in people who inject drugs, we need to further optimise uh, OST and NSP coverage. We're, we're doing pretty well, but we can always do a bit better. And I think we're getting this right, access to retreatment for reinfection and virological failure. So I just wanted to quickly sort of go through some numbers in terms of um, populations of people who inject drugs. Um, so some people get a bit confused about who you're talking about. So I think it's, it's uh, worthwhile defining who we are talking about. So we've got a population that have ever injected. Um, and within that, in that we've got a population of people that are on OST and a population of people that are currently injecting. And obviously those two populations overlap. Um, in Australia about the people on methadone or buprenorphine, probably about 50 to maybe 60% of those have injected in the last sort of six or, or 12 months. Um, and then we've got a large number of people who are not on OST, obviously. Um, these are our estimates of our population. So I said there's 230,000 people with chronic hepatitis C. 80% we believe have acquired infection through injecting drug use. 20%, most of those have been uh, people who have migrated from high prevalence countries. We have a lot of people migrated from Egypt, Pakistan, Southeast Asia, um, areas of higher sort of prevalence but we think about 80%. Of those, our estimates are that there's 45,000 people who are, are current injectors, okay? And of those, 15,000 are on methadone or buprenorphine, okay? Uh, then we've got, obviously, other people on methadone and buprenorphine not currently injecting. And if you look at the current injecting population, so about a third are on OST. Um, so there's a large number of people who are not in what we might call a more stable environment for hepatitis C treatment delivery. And I think this is one of the key sort of populations we'll need to sort of you know, find solutions for in terms of reaching people as far as uh, hepatitis C treatment's concerned. We're doing a lot of research in terms of building the evidence base for hepatitis C elimination. And clearly these are the key populations, people who inject drugs. They obviously interface with the prison population, unfortunately, because of the high incarceration rates that we have in Australia for drug-related crime. Um, OST, obviously, 
we have a, a co-infection population, but it's quite a small population. Um, so we only have it estimated about 2,500 people that have HIV and hepatitis C co-infection, largely gained by sexual men. Because our prevalence of HIV amongst people who inject drugs is about a percent, okay? So it's very low, it has been for, for many, many years. Um, so, but we have some projects in the co-infected population as well. We think we can eliminate hep C from that population in five years, um, not ten years. Um, so we have some programs in the Drug and Alcohol Services, a program called Live a Life. I'll talk a little bit about uh, another uh, cohort called Ethos 2. We have some studies in the active injecting population. I know that there's some Swiss sites involved uh, in the Simplify study, which is looking at Sophosphavir Velpatosphir among people that are actively injecting the first study of its type uh, to really look at that regimen in a population of people that are actively injecting. We have the DEFEAT study through the same Activate network, the international network that we lead from the Kirby that's looking at uh, Vicirapac uh, in people who are actively injecting. Uh, we have STOP-C, which is a treatment as prevention uh, trial or study in the prison setting in New South Wales, four sort of prisons where we're rapidly scaling up from, uh, from actually this month with the phosphorus velpatosphere. We've been monitoring incidents of hepatitis C in those prisons over the last 12 to 18 months, and then we'll rapidly scale up and we'll look at the impact of the rapid scale up on transmission in the prison setting. We have the CEASE uh, initiative, which is a HIV hepatitis C elimination initiative, which has a, a number of sub-projects. Um, so we have a, a series of different studies. REACT is a study, in a national study again that we're leading, which is in acute hepatitis C, where we're comparing 12 weeks of sophosphere velpatosphere to six weeks to see whether we can get by with shortened duration of therapy for people with recently acquired infection. So all these sort of studies sort of have some links and elements that are important in terms of evaluating uh, hepatitis C treatment prevention and heading towards elimination. So what about monitoring how we're going and evaluating uh, we're obviously looking at the numbers of people commenced on treatment, we're looking at prescriber patterns, we're going to be looking at geographical coverage, so it'll be important to see whether we're doing as well in the rural and regional areas as, as we are in the metropolitan, sort of urban areas, obviously looking across different populations groups, and we'll be looking at treatment completion and retreatment rates as well. This is a real world study called REIT-C, uh, where we're setting up a national registry that's going to cover some tertiary clinics, primary care, drug and alcohol service, and prison clinics. So we'll get outcomes from a, a range of different settings. Um, we've got this uh, capacity, because hepatitis C has been a mandatory notification since the early 1990s, we have very large sort of uh, public health surveillance databases. Um, so in New South Wales, the state where I work, uh, we have more than 100,000 notifications of hepatitis C. So we can link those notifications with a whole series of administrative data sets. So we link to hospitalisation, cancer registry, uh, death index, we actually can link to incarceration registry, methadone OST registry, and we're also able to link uh, to what we call our pharmaceutical benefits scheme in terms of the individualised treatment. So that's very powerful in terms of being able to monitor the impact of these new therapies on disease burden, uh, hospitalisation, etc. <coughs> Um, and one of the other important outcomes as we scale up is how we're doing amongst people that are actively injecting. So we have a, a national uh, needle and syringe program survey where for one week each year we survey about 2,500 people who are actively injecting who are uh, coming to NSP sites for clean injecting equipment. We have a behavioural survey, uh, we're adding in, we've added in questions about treatment, we've added in some questions about reinfection and we do finger prick for dried blood spot. So we've been monitoring HIV and hepatitis C antibody since uh, the mid 1990s through that surveillance sort of system. Uh, and we've just started last year uh, monitoring hep C RNA as well. So we'll be able to then, going forward, look at what the hep C RNA prevalence is amongst active injectors. So at the moment it's about 40%. So obviously we want to show that trending downwards as we treat more and more people who are actively injecting. And obviously the RNA prevalence takes into account the reinfections as well, so what you're really trying to achieve is to get that 40% sort of starting to edge downwards. Um, so it'll be really interesting to monitor through that system. We also can sequence the virus so we can look for DAA resistance 
through that sort of surveillance system as well. I'm not a big worry about resistance. I don't think it's going to be a huge problem. I think there's some great salvage regiments coming through, but we, it's something we need, need to keep a bit of an eye on. So we'll be doing that. And we need to obviously have other measures of transmission. So we have, a, as I said, a great surveillance system uh, in terms of notifications. So we use the younger age notifications, generally the 15 to 19 and the 20 to 24 year old age notifications, which are generally reflective of recent transmissions. And because our testing rates are pretty high, so people who are actively injecting, um, about 60% of them have been tested in the previous uh, 12 months and there are more than 90% have ever been tested. So we've got pretty high levels of ongoing screening. So we'll be able to, and we do, track those number of notifications of hepatitis C in those younger age groups. Um, we're also setting up sort of longitudinal sort of studies um, to look at reinfection sort of rates. Everyone's very concerned about reinfection, so I've got to obviously monitor that um, closely. I don't think it's going to be as big a problem as uh, some people do. So this is the, the one page form that we've developed for the REACH C study. We're also using this for the GPs for their consultation component. So they can complete this form, they can send it to me. It's got just basic demographic and clinical details, the regimen that's selected, the duration, plan duration, and then we've got the treatment outcome and adherence sort of measure. Very simple. That data will be uploaded into the National Registry and then we'll be able to sort of monitor that as we sort of move forward. We didn't want to make it too complicated, but it's important to sort of have some measures and be able to look at your outcomes by some of these key clinical and demographic details. Um, just want to talk a little bit about models of care in Australia. Uh, obviously, we haven't been doing too well in the interferon containing era. We've got a lot of work to do to increase, increase uh, sort of RNA diagnosis, linkage to care, liver disease assessment. I think, look, I think the answer to a lot of this is that we need a range of different models of care. You can't eliminate hepatitis C or even think about eliminating hepatitis C through a tertiary care model. It's not going to happen. Now, you'll, you'll do reasonably well, you'll stop you know, some people from dying from advanced liver disease complications, but you're not going to get control of a public health problem. You're not going to get control of transmission of the hepatitis C virus just by focusing on tertiary care, by focusing on people with significant fibrosis. So you need a broader approach, you need a range of different models of care that are suitable for different settings that can reach different populations. And this is what we're really trying to do in Australia. This is just one study, the Live Life campaign. I know Jason, my, my colleague, was here last year talking about it, so I'll just flick this through this quickly. This is a, a sort of health promotion campaign that's been run, running in drug and alcohol services where our focus was to try and get people to look at their liver health, to get a fibro scan done. We have a range of materials, booklets. Uh, we've got a fibro scan report form that the clients sort of take away with them as a record with some information about the score and what that means in terms of liver disease. We've got a video uh, in terms of information around hepatitis C and liver health. So it's been a really successful and exciting campaign to be part of. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but this is the sort of campaign days. We go into the clinics. We go one day a week to four weeks to different sort of clinics. We provide healthy food and coffee and, and we engage with our clients and uh, do the surveys, get them scanned. They link into the, the clinical team at the site in terms of further sort of follow up. And uh, it's really been a neat sort of project. Um, we're also evaluating a point of care uh, machine by a company called Cepheid. Um, and the latest sort of version is that we do a finger prick uh, blood test that's taken up in a pipette, 100 microliters, goes into the cassette, goes into one of these machines, and the, it's a quantitative viral load result within 60 minutes. So this is the direction I think that things are heading in. Uh, now, it's not accredited at the moment in Australia. Hopefully it will be in the next sort of year. Uh, but in terms of trying to develop a bit of a one-stop shop in some of the models of care, I think it would be quite good. For example, you might have regular clients of the service that have been worked up, they've been tested for hepatitis C, um, including RNA testing even, but their injecting partners may not be. So if you're going to treat someone, you know, if you do an injecting social contact sort of you know, uh, questionnaire and they've got a regular injecting partner, you could bring them in, get them point of care tested, is their RNA positive, to you know, start treatment on both the index sort of uh, patient and their sort of injecting partner. So I think we need to think strategically in terms of elimination um, if we're going to really uh, achieve uh, our goals. And, and this will sort of help, I think, 
as part of the package. Just some, we did some four pilot sort of clinics, initial phase, very marginalised population. You can see here, very low proportion in full or part-time employment. Um, incarceration rates a third in the last 12 months, two thirds ever in prison. So this is a very sort of typical for Australia in a drug and alcohol service, marginalised sort of population. So we weren't going capturing sort of the better off sort of you know, subpopulations at all. Um, not surprisingly, uh, only about 20% had advanced fibrosis. That's what you would predict based on the, the age distribution of the population. So most people had early disease. Uh, but the great thing is these people here, um, if they have chronic hepatitis C, can have access to therapy. So the 70% of people are not restricted at all in terms of therapy. Um, so just wanted to sort of finish on uh, a, a personal sort of perspective. So I work in three different settings. So this is a traditional tertiary care clinic. I do one or two sort of dinner half day clinics a week at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney as an ID physician, two ID doctors and a gastrohepatologist in a clinical service. Um, we've commenced, uh, as I was talking before, I started uh, getting close to 600 uh, patients on DA therapy since March. Um, our target was 1,000 through that one sort of clinic at the start of the year, so I think we'll get pretty close to that 1,000. Um, I also do a fortnightly clinic, the methadone clinic on the same campus, have done that for over a decade. Um, and these are just my personal sort of numbers, so this is just my numbers at the, at the St Vincent's Clinic since March, up until I went on sort of leave. Um, so I'd started 224, and you can see here, even though I'm a clinician that people know is absolutely fine in terms of treating active injectors, um, it's still a small proportion in that tertiary clinic. And we're sort of known for being a clinic that has no concerns whatsoever about treating active injectors. But you can see here, only 16% were current injectors. So most of the people who were treating through that tertiary clinic, okay, they acquired their infection through injecting drug use, but they're not current injectors, okay? Um, and a you know, small proportion on uh, methadone or buprenorphine. Um, so if we're going to, it gets back to my point, if we're going to achieve elimination, we can't do it through a tertiary care model, okay? We can treat a lot of people, particularly in this early sort of period, but we won't head towards elimination because we're not going to control transmission through treating just lifetime injectors, okay? It's great for their individual health and it's really important that we're providing access, but if we're thinking about treatments prevention, elimination, it's not going to work. Um, and this is going back to the Australian figures, this 30,000 people and this 45,000 people over, overall that are current injectors is a, you know, is a really crucial population. And we might do okay um, with this group through methadone clinic delivered therapy, but we need to develop mechanisms for this population as well. And I've been fortunate enough to, to work at a community health clinic and Philip uh, visited uh, the clinic last year called the Kirkton Road Centre. I've been working there uh, once a month for over a decade, plugging away with interferon-based therapy, treating a few people every year, <laughs> um, not very successfully because you know, it's such a sort of toxic therapy uh, to get through, but it's been amazing since this new therapy has arrived. Um, so it's a broad-based primary care service that does you know, blood-borne virus management, sexual health, um, does some methadone uh, dosing, is a, you know, provides clean injecting equipment as well. Um, and these are the numbers just from there. And I've mentored a clinician there and a couple of nurses. So they had their own sort of team there um, and are now sort of treating with DAA therapy. And I'm just, a, you know, I pop in once a month and they send me through those consultation forms and I sign off on them, but that's about it. So they do the management. But just to give you an idea, they've started since March 92 of the clients there, we estimate about 400 to 450 of the clients have chronic hepatitis C in the service and we're getting close to the first four months to treating you know, a quarter of them. Um, so a pretty impressive start. And you can see here, uh, the large majority of them, so 75% are current injectors. So it's a very different sort of population than through my tertiary clinic. So look, this is a, an ideal sort of model but it's the sort of service I think we really need to encourage to really get to that sort of more marginalised, um, harder to reach sort of population. And look, they've been doing incredibly well. If I think of how we're going in terms of adherence and so forth, we'll obviously be collecting and reporting on data, but 
the unifying theme across all these settings is how sort of how much gratitude um, the patients have in terms of access to these new therapies and how incredibly motivated they are. And through the Kirkton Road Clinic, we've had people that are homeless, we've had people that are incredibly marginalised, but are still able to sort of, you know, take their therapy. Uh, obviously, many of them have needed more support uh, than do the non sort of complex patients, but they're doing incredibly well. Um, just very briefly, um, I wanted to mention a couple of things about treatment prevention. Um, this is a little bit similar to the previous sort of diagram, but it brings in this prison population. So in any one year, about 50,000 people in Australia are incarcerated. Okay. So of those, about 25% will have chronic hepatitis C. So that's a sort of 12,500 important population. Again, you're going to think about eliminating the virus. So unfortunately, because of the transitioning, well, in terms of treatment prevention, it's an opportunity in a sense to have good programs in the prison, good programs in the OST sort of setting, because there's large transitioning here and large transitioning here. So at least if you can get those two sort of settings sorted out, hopefully you can start driving down the infection burden. Uh, and some modelling that we did with Natasha Martin and Peter Vickerman before showed that in the Australian setting at least, if we treat about 8% of active injectors per year, we should be able to get there in around about a decade. Um, but you've got to keep going. So no, obviously no point treating 8% in year one and 8% in year two and then things sort of st start sort of slackening off. You've really got to keep, keep on top of it. And preferably we'd like to treat not 8% in year one but maybe 15%. So it'll be really interesting when we get the data through, we'll get it later this year, about what proportion through that needle syringe program survey have commenced therapy since March. And that will be a really crucial first look at what our estimate of the active injecting population that have commenced therapy is. And I'm hoping it's not too much lower than the broader population. I think it will be lower, um, and if we treat you know, 17, 18% of the broader population, uh, in 2016, I'm hopeful that we might treat 10 to 15 percent of the active injecting population. So we certainly will be head of year one in terms of this 8 percent sort of uh, modelling estimate that we need to get to. Um, I just want to flick through, this is a, a study that we have in the prison setting, uh, the so-called STOP-C study. We're evaluating a rapid sort of scale-up of interferon-free uh, therapy and we're looking at incidence and prevalence of hep C infection. Uh, the prison population, not surprisingly, um, is a sort of a large population in Australia. That unfortunately, it's increasing, 7% increase recently, largely male, and 50% of people incarcerated report uh, prior injecting drug use. A lot of rec recidivism, so almost 60% have previously been incarcerated, and a high Indigenous proportion. So the Australian Indigenous population is only about 2% of the population they have more than a tenfold increased risk of being incarcerated. Um, and this is a STOP-C project. As I said, we've been monitoring incidence and prevalence uh, the last sort of year or so. We're just about to start the scale up, obviously doing a range of other sort of research projects. Uh, through four prisons, two what we call maximum security prisons, Goulburn and Lithgow, two medium security prisons, one um, Dilwinia is a female prison. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what impact we have. This is our sort of baseline testing. This is about what we would expect. This is our viremic proportion ranging from 24%. This is the female prison. Uh, the female hepatitis C prevalence is high because there's a high proportion of women that are incarcerated for drug-related crime. That's the reason why the hep C prevalence is higher. Um, you can see here in the red, this is the proportion of people that are antibody pos positive, RNA negative. So they've been infected, they're, this is largely people that spontaneously cleared the virus. So we're obviously monitoring incidents of new infections in this group uninfected and also incidents of reinfections before the treatment scale up in this group as well. And then we'll look at the impact of the therapy on this. Um, the treatment scale up, as I said, will start this month. Uh, it's with sofosbuvir, velpatasvir, 12 weeks uh, across uh, different disease stages um, according to the label. And, and you know, uh, an ideal regimen for this sort of project given its pan sort of genotypic uh, efficacy. And look, lots of people that we work with and collaborate with uh, and funders, both public sector and private sort of sector, uh, that support the work that, uh, that we do. So thanks very much for your attention.